so much for joining me on my channel today and today I have the flip through of how I journaled through the book of Luke during the month of March along with a daily grace um, reading plan for the behold reading plan. And so um, I am going to kind of flip through the book of Luke. I have already done the book of Matthew and the book of Mark. So if you have missed those books, I will list those below. I also show a little bit of the resources that I use. One of the resources that I do use in the beginning part of the month or the beginning part of each book is what I should say, is the Bible Binder by the James Method. And um, just to show you real quick, I do like a deep dive into each book using this Bible Binder and some other resources. And I'm gonna actually have a more in-depth video of um, how I've been using the Bible Binder uh, this year. So I'll have that video up this week. So look forward to that. Another thing that I am using are my favorite and I know you guys are going to ask. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you up front. My favorite pens and highlighters to use in my Bible have been the Mr. Pen multi liners and their highlighters. And uh, recently I've started using the gel highlighters as well. If you have missed my unboxing of their Bible journaling kit, um, that posted a couple of days ago and I will have that linked below as well. And I have an affiliate link for these um, down in the description box. So let's go ahead and dig into this. I'm just gonna put my pen pouch away and let's dig in. Okay, so I'm gonna bring you a little bit closer just so you can see, there we go. Okay, so the book of Luke. I really love the book of Luke. It is a book that I usually read during the Advent season with my family. And so I love the book of Luke and um, it was nice to read it outside of the Advent season uh, because I think you get glimpses of different things depending on the season you're in. I know those of you that have reread books over and over know what I mean. So starting off here, Luke, um, also called the Gospel of Knowing. I had to write that in there um, as I was doing my journaling time. And so it Luke starts with an introduction that fastly brings you into um, what is, who is Luke, right? Who he's writing to. Luke, uh, actually writes two different books, Luke and the book of Acts. So this is essentially part one of his two book type combination. So um, over here, I did a little doodling just who this was to. to it was to Theophilus, um, which means beloved of God. And he calls him most honorable Theophilus. So you kind of think that it, he must have been somebody really important. Um, I talk about how Luke was a physician and how that is detailed in Colossians 4.14. And why he wrote the book of Luke is to prove the stories of Jesus's life and the gospel to be true. And um, he talks about that in his intro to Theophilus. Okay, so you see some highlighting, some underlining as usual. You'll see some dates of um, 2023. That is because in the um, in the Advent season of 2023, my family, we all read through the book of Luke together. So you may see some of that and some older notes as well. But I just included it all together because I love seeing insights from then to now. Um, here I have a little fun fact Friday. This I get off of the Daily Grace Co. podcast and I screenshot it on from their Instagram and add it here. And this is just tons of little notes about Luke. I love including those here in the beginning of each book, you know, who wrote it and you know, who he, who the person is. Um, and it's actually inspired me to do another project that I hope to share on this channel soon. So I have tons of little notes. Um, this is an older note from when I read through the first time. Then I have this post-it note over here, also from the Daily Grace Co., where I'm writing the time that is written, Luke, who's a physician, the fact that he writes like a historian with tons of details, um, and also that he makes it a point to feature the women in the life of Jesus and how they are part of his ministry. I thought that was some really interesting facts there to include. Tons of more notes here. I write about how Mary's response to the angel and to the mission that God gave her and that message that God gave her through the messenger, the angel, was yes, yes to the Lord. Um, and that's what it means here. Mary's fiat, let it be done. I love that. There was submission and willingness 
from Mary, right? And there was a trust in what the Lord had said, right? There was no doubt there. And it says, be it on to me. Love that. And then we have go into Mary's visits. And this is one of my favorite verses. Um, Luke 145, you are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her is usually the um, translation that you guys would hear. Then we go into the Magnificat and this includes 35 references to the Old Testament. Or in other words, that the praise that Mary is giving includes um, Old Testament passages. So this lets us know that Mary knew scripture. She knew her Bible. She was someone that studied, um, you know, the scriptures from the Old Testament. You can also find a song of praise in 1st of Samuel chapter 2. And then I just made notes about the different things that I found in her um, in her song of praise. He is faithful. God is faithful. He is merciful. God is merciful. He keeps his promise to us. Then we go into the birth of John the Baptist and this beautiful story of Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth. I love rereading that every Advent season. And here we go into Zachariah's praise, which is the Benedictus. And then here it's a song of thanksgiving that is given by Zachariah the moment that his voice returns, of course, because he goes mute. That's what happens to him when he doubts what the angel tells him. And he just goes into this overwhelming praise that goes over and over. And I love this. Here I highlighted all the different things that um, comes out in this praise song. Um, it says, he visited his people and he is redeemed. Praising God because he is a redeemer. He has sent his mighty savior. He is a savior. Um um, from his loyal line, from his royal line of of servant David, he's a server to us, just as he promised. He's a promise keeper, and now we see that he saved us from our enemies. He's a defender. He has been merciful to our ancestors. He's faithful. He is a faithful father by remembering his sacred covenant. Again, faithful father. We have been rescued. He is a rescuer. Um, so we can serve the God without fear in holiness and righteousness. He's a righteous judge. And you, my little son, and here he's speaking about John, because you will prepare the way for the Lord, you will tell his people how to find salvation. Repent and believe was John's message to the people. And here we talk about the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give us light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. He was here to point them to Jesus, who was the light and the peace that they needed. All of those things I was just reading and pulling from Zachariah's prophecy. What is this saying about God? And that is the best way that you can read the word of God. What does this say about God's character? How does this confirm what scripture has already said? How does this confirm what you see God doing in your life? God's character is seen over and over in scripture even in the praises, even in the prayers, even in the little stories, all the little details, we can see that. And that was me pulling those things out. We go into the birth of Jesus, and then we go into the Gloria, glory to God in the highest. Then um, we go even further into the prophecy of Simeon. This is another praise, the Nunc Dimittis. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. It's a prayer that shows that one is prepared to die because of the salvation of the Lord. I love this. I also love this uh, section over here where it says Mary stored and treasured all the moments in her heart. Then we go into John the Baptist, how he prepares the way. We see that in the book of Isaiah. He is that voice shouting in the wilderness. Um, after 400 years of silence, how there was no prophets, but then the Lord gives that message to um, John. And that is seen here. At this time, a message from God came to John, the son of Zechariah, after 40, 400 years of silence. Um, here we talk about how Luke focuses a lot on the gospel being for all people and how we should not just talk the talk, but we should walk the walk. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. 
Here uh, we talk about, uh, this is a quote from Kristen from the Daily Grace Co. podcast. John's life mission mission was to point people to Jesus. And we see that in this story here. Then we look at the baptism of Jesus. And here I talk about how Jesus' identi identity was confirmed when the voice of heaven comes and says, you are my dearly beloved son and you bring me great joy. I love that. Here, Jesus was known as the son of Joseph, Jesus, the son of God, I'm sorry, the son of man. And then as we go further, we can see Adam was the son of God, right? This is the descendants, Jesus, the son of God, how that is confirmed right here. Then we look at the temptation of Jesus. And these are some, um, we have some older notes mixed with some newer notes, how Jesus was tempted, um, how the secret place and separation results in being filled with the Holy Spirit and his power. Because right over the, at, right after the temptation, one, two, three, right, times, we go into Jesus returning to Galilee and it says filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit's power. And my note to that was that secret place, that separation that Jesus experimented in the wilderness over here was what resulted in the spirit and his power, right? How that is detailed here. Over here, uh, we go further into what happened in Nazareth and how he was rejected by his own people. Then Jesus casting out a demon. Although Jesus' people didn't acknowledge him as a Messiah, the demons did. Because the demons said, um, why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So it's interesting to know that Jesus' own people rejected him and they didn't acknowledge him as the Messiah. And yet, these demons did. So interesting. Um, we go into the first disciples and we can see the story of the first disciples and how that took place. Um, Jesus is Lord over nature. Our sin can make us feel like we need to run from Jesus, but it's when we are in sin that we should run to Jesus. And that is a quote from Kristen in the Daily Grace um, Co -pad podcast as well. Um, over here, Jesus heals a man with leprosy. And I put Jesus touch the untouchable. I mean, a man that is rejected, that is usually isolated, right? And untouchable is what they called them. Teach Jesus touched that. What we in our human nature would not do. Jesus did that. And he did it in grace and mercy and compassion. And he healed that person. We go into Jesus paralyzing a man. The faith of the young man's friends moved Jesus. And, and it's important to have friends that bring us closer to Jesus. That was my takeaway from that. Um, Jesus forgives our sins. He didn't just heal the young man, but he said, young man, your sins are forgiven. He doesn't just want to provide, you know, um, spiritual health and physical health for us. He also wants to forgive our sins first and foremost. Um, Jesus, the calling of Jesus to Levi or Matthew, Jesus is looking for humble people in need of a savior. A discussion about fasting, don't compare yourself to others and their spiritual life. Seek your own relationship with Jesus because they were talking about how the John's, um, John's, John the Baptist disciples, they would feast and fast regularly, but Jesus' disciples did not. And here I just made a note. Don't compare yourself to others in their spiritual life, what they're doing. Seek your own relationship with Jesus. Okay, then we go into discussions about the, the Sabbath, right? And how the, those implications and how they tested Jesus over and over, we see that. We shortly go into the Beatitudes, the poor in spirit, the, those that hunger for righteousness, and how a great reward awaits those that give it all to follow Jesus. Jesus rewards those that have given it all for him. We talk about the sorrows of those that is the opposite of those that are being blessed in, and into the kingdom of God. This is the sorrows, the woes to those that put their faith on things of this earth. 
love your enemies and here i point out the golden rule do unto others as you would like them to do that's important to note because some people think that the golden rule just came out of something secu secular but you can find that right here in scripture uh we go on to not judging others the tree and its fruit and here i wrote about a little bit about building a solid foundation a solid foundation equals the gospel but sinking sand equals the world. What is in our hearts will come out, Kristen says in the Daily Grace Go podcast. Over here, I talk about Jesus talking to John when John says, are you the one we're expecting? And Jesus says to him, tell him, tell him everything that you have seen. And so I detail this over here. The blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and the dead were raised. These were all the things that they had that had been foretold that was happening. And Jesus was telling, tell John of everything that is happening over here. Um, I did, of course, you know, more reading, but I brought in this little note that says being with Jesus is always the right choice. And this is um, for Luke 7 through 11. Those that follow wisdom are the children of wisdom. Right over here, here Luke highlights the women that traveled with Jesus and how they financially supported Jesus in his ministry. Talks about that in chapter eight. And I put here, women are important in ministry. Down here, the parable of the lamp. I put a little sticker, light and darkness. The more you listen and obey to God, the more you will understand his ways and follow them, right? The more you become part of the light. And then we go further into Jesus healing a possessed man, the true family of Jesus, right? My mother, my brothers, he says, all are those who hear God's word and obey it. The way of being part of the family of Christ bears great responsibility. We need to know that our mission, first and foremost, is what is important. And Jesus knew that. And that's why he said, my mother, my brothers are those that hear God's word and obey it. Um, we go into here where it says, where is your faith when Jesus calms the storm? And I talk about how, how many times have we um, doubted, right? After seeing and walked and experienced that Jesus can still the waters, but we doubt. And I talk a little bit about that here. Then about Jesus sending out the 12 disciples. And I did a little word study on the word proclaim. He sent them out to proclaim, it says, and that's Strong's G2784, to be a herald to the pro to be a herald and to proclaim the coming of a king. Then we have some more notes over here about Jesus providing physically and abundantly. And this comes into with the Jesus, Jesus feeding the 500. Over here, I talk about following Jesus and how there is um, a consequence to that, right? It's a risk. And then Jesus predicting his death. The transfiguration, Moses is there. He represents the law. Elijah was there. He represents the prophet. And then Jesus was there, of course. And he represents the fulfillment of all of it. Then I have a little note here that says, we will never be satisfied by an abundance of things or money, but by the abundance of Christ himself. Both of these, if I didn't say it before, um, these little squares that you find are also screenshot from the Daily Grace, um, Daily Grace Co. podcast Instagram. And I love to include those quotes in here. Um, here we talk about using the name of Jesus, the cost of following Jesus. Following Jesus comes at a high cost. You must leave behind everything and walk forward without looking back at what you've left behind. Jesus, again, sending out his disciples, right? And how their walk is beginning in faith. And over here, I talk about rejection of the gospel being a rejection of Jesus himself. And the only way to salvation is Jesus. Joy is the outcome of preaching the gospel. It is the good news for all mankind. And it says here that when the 72 disciples returned from Jesus sending them out, they joyfully reported to him. Joy is the outcome of preaching the gospel. Um, over here, we go into visit the visit of Martha and Mary and how um, Mary sat at the Lord's feet, but Martha was so consumed with um, the things of the home. And here I just put a 
you know, a prayer about how I want to be more like Mary and less like Martha because sometimes I do fall into that. And I like to be honest. And sometimes just writing a prayer actually grounds me for that day. It doesn't need to be always notes. Uh, teaching about prayer. And I put here, remember the key is prayer, specifically constant and persistent, uh, constant and persistent prayer life. How much more then will our Father give us only what is good for us. Over here, but even more blessed are all those who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Be a doer of the word. Then we look at the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah is the sign of, a re of the resurrection. This is when Jesus talks to this as the crowd pressed into him. We look at uh, Jesus criticizing the religious leaders and how we talk about how we shouldn't fall into the yeast of the Pharisees. I have a little note here from the Daily Grace Go podcast Instagram. We see Jesus as the example of what it means to be faithful in the small things and in the great things. Don't fear man, fear God, right? Don't fear what man is going to say because that's what the Pharisees were looking at. Um, also, I have a quote from Kristen here. Jesus knew persecution was coming and Jesus wanted his followers to know that God was with them. And this is how we talk here about the Lord watching us and every hair on your head are numbered. The Lord watches us over us, I put. The Spirit also gives testimony of who we are, I place here. For the Spirit will teach you at the time what needs to be said. So it says, do not be afraid when you go into trial and you brought, brought before the synagogues because he don't do not defend yourself. The Spirit will teach you what to say. Here we go into the parable of the rich fool and I put the subject of greed. Don't try to find satisfaction in the things or money. Instead, be satisfied in Christ because only he can truly satisfy us. I have some more readings here. Um, talks about anxiety. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Trusting that God's provision is a matter, trusting God's provision because that is a matter of faith. Talk about that there. Here we look at seek the kingdom of God above all else and he will give you everything you need. Jesus invites us to focus our attention on the things that will last for all eternity. I got that from the podcast as well. And here another uh, screenshot from Daily Grace Co. The embodiment of God's kindness and mercy. That's what we behold Jesus as. In the call to repentance over here where it says, is that why they suffered? Not at all. Note, this is confirmation that not all who suffer is caused by sin. And I put a little reference that see also John chapter 9 verses 1 through 2 when it talks about a situation where um, someone was not suffering, right? Their sickness was not because of the father's sins. Here we go into um, the narrow door. Contrary to what Jesus, the Jews believed, salvation would be open to all who received and believed in Jesus. It would be through his sacrifice and belief in, in it that they would be saved, not through their birth or genealogy. That is what the narrow door is about. Jesus is that narrow door, right? Over here, we're looking at Jesus teaching about humility. Our culture tells us to work ourselves to the top, but Jesus calls us to be humble, um, to humble ourselves and to seek God for others, not compare ourselves to them. Or to seek the good and to seek God for others, not to compare ourselves to them. And then we have the parable of the great feast. The first invitation of this banquet is from the law and the prophets. The second invitation comes through Jesus, but many have not answered. There is still room, right, at the table. That's why we must follow and continue to preach. Over here, we have abide, deep, abide dwell, seek, um, next to the parable of the lost sheep. I love this uh, quote from Tom Boston. Thomas Boston, it says, no man can be a true disciple of Christ to whom Christ is not dearer than what is dearest to him on earth. It says, we are like lost sheep 
and we don't find our way to him, he runs after us. He puts us on his shoulder and carries us home. This is about the parable of the last of the lost sheep. Um, here with the parable of the lost son, I place a uh, note. A father's love was not dependent on the child's behavior. True repentance is shown in a humble apology because you see how the 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 parable of the lost son how the son he comes humbly and he says father i have sinned against you and of heaven and against heaven and i'm no longer worthy of being called your son please take me as your hired servant he had true repentance in his heart moving on um to investing in what matters for eternity and this comes into the parable of the shrewd manager I have another note about Jesus. Jesus calls us to come to him needy and dependent like little children. We And we rest in the truth that he will never turn us away. Over here, I have many notes um, in a, about the teachings of forgiveness and about 10 being healed by leprosy. One of the things that I love is people often think that if they do what they should, God owes them, but God is not indebted to us, indebted to us. That's what Kristen says. Um, we need to know that the teaching of forgiveness and faith is that in the same way, when you obey me, you should say we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. God doesn't owe us anything. In the 10 healed of leprosy, only one of them came back. And it says here, or I made a note that there is sin in ungratefulness. See 2 of Timothy 3, chap, um, chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, through 2. And I put ungratefulness brings or breeds entitlement. We, over here, we talk a little bit about the kingdom of heaven and how the Pharisees missed the coming of the kingdom. They had missed it because they didn't think that Jesus was their king. And they were waiting for a political kingdom, but Jesus' kingdom is different. It's an upside down kingdom. And they were looking for a king to conquer the Romans, but Jesus came to conquer their hearts. That was my note. Um, when we were talking about the kingdom of the coming of the kingdom of heaven, um, then the parable of the persistent widow, how much more will God do for us if this evil judge granted the persistent, cry, the persistent cry of the widow? More notes over here about how we must all come to Jesus as children because Jesus blessed the children. Um, and then over here, Jesus, yet again, he predicts his prediction, he predicts his death. And this is the third prediction. Um, another note here in chapter 18, verse 27, what is impossible for people is possible with God it is only through and with God that we can be saved. Our own strength and righteousness cannot. It seems unattainable, but with God, it is possible. Then we go into Jesus and Zacchaeus. I love, love, love this story. And I put here, as much as Zacchaeus wanted Jesus, Jesus wanted him more. And we see that in his story and how he wanted to dine with Zacchaeus because he knew that salvation was for his home in that day. And that is a quote from Kristen on the podcast. Um, over here is a parable of the 10 servants. And I put a note, how should God's people live while we wait for God's return or for Jesus's return? This shows us how we can steward what God has placed in our hands correctly. Then, of course, we go into the Passion Week, the um, triumphant uh, entry. This is Psalm, uh, Palm Sunday and the story of Holy Week. I write out Zechariah 9.9 that brings that into here. You can also see Psalm 118.26 for Palm Sunday. Um, Jesus weeping over Jerusalem and how Jesus laments and Jesus prophesies what would happen to the temple in AD 70. Uh, we go into Jesus being um, challenged about 
how Jesus had zeal for the Lord and how he clears the temple. We also go into the parable of the evil farmers and how the um, tenant farmers were the kings and leaders of Israel. The servants were the prophets. The other and uh, the different prophets that came in the Old Testament, the owner is God himself and how the son of the owner is Jesus. You can also see Isaiah 5, Psalm 80, and Jeremiah 2 to find more context into all of this and why this would have related to the Jews in that time. Uh, taxes being for Caesar, give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what is to God. Here I did a breakdown of the Sadducees and I actually want to do an even deeper breakdown between the Sadducees and the Pharisees because I found that so interesting. I did a deep dive separate from my reading for this. And um, I love this. Our God is the God of the living and not the dead. We are alive in him and through the death of Christ. Another, um, this is just Zechariah 9, 9 printed off of a screenshot of the Daily Grace Co. Um, Instagram here. Uh, we talk about the widow's offering. Those two coins meant to him, to Jesus, more than the rest combined because the heart that she brought her offering to him. That was a quote from there. Over here, I wrote out the four don'ts of chapter 21. And this is by Philip Riken. Don't be led astray. Don't be afraid. Don't miss the opportunity to witness and don't give up. This is the hope that we should hold on to. The time is near. So when all these things begin to happen, stand and look up for your salvation is near. And that is chapter 21, verse 28. In our last few chapters, we are wrapping up that Passion Week. We look at G uh, Jesus predicting Peter's denial. We look at the Last Supper and the New Covenant. I write out Jeremiah 31, 33 that talks about the New Covenant that he talks about in the Last Supper. Um, we have another verse here in the mountain of olives and i love this quote it says in the garden jesus doesn't or the in the mount of olives the garden of the gethsemane but in the garden jesus doesn't teach us to face suffering without fear but to give ourselves completely to god in spite of our fear i love that quote from Kristen. here uh peter denies denies jesus and i listed them out one two three and i put even in the midst of peter's denial there was mercy and grace Jesus knew Peter would deny him, but also he knew who Peter was and who Peter would be for the kingdom. That's a quote from me. I have a um, quote here from Beth White. It says, Christ's death and resurrection was a world-changing event that demonstrates his victory over sin and death. And it laid the foundation for the future hope we have as believers. So much is brought into the last chapters, Jesus' trial, I have a little detail about Herod Antipas, about Pilate and how he couldn't find a reason to kill Jesus, but he still did to please the people, about how Barabbas was released. The guilty one was set free, but the righteous one was sent to the cross. Um, I did a word study on Calvary and Golgotha over here, um, Strong's Concordance G2898, and how redemption was shown even here at the cross to the thief over on the right even on the cross jesus prays for those that have mocked him and then he receives the repentance of the criminal that hung beside him for this jesus died so he showed that to the very end absolutely love that another screenshot from the instagram page shame was defeated on the cross of calvary I love this Charles Spurgeon quote. It says, when two saints are talking together, Jesus is very likely to come and make the third one in the company. Talk of him and you will soon talk with him. This is about the two followers on the walk to Emmaus and how Jesus um, actually appeared to them there and he speaks to them and walks with them until they broke bread together. Then Jesus appears to some of the disciples and he gives his message. And lastly, the ascension of Jesus. And here is my last note for that. I put, the, I put this screenshot that says, The ascension reminds us that Jesus is building and expanding his kingdom now through us. 
So we have that Great Commission, but then right after that, we have the Ascension and how it says that we are now the ones that Jesus is building his kingdom through. And that is a wrap of Luke 24. I have already started John, as you can see, and I, of course, will have a wrap or flip through of that at the end. Stay tuned for the video that I will have showing you how I'm using this together with this. And let me know below what else, what questions do you have about the Bible binder? So I can answer those in that video that I'll be filming and uploading this week. And how else would you like me to break down what the readings that I've been doing? Thank you so much for joining me. If you are here and you are new, I hope you consider subscribing. Hit the like button and the notification bell so you don't miss any of my videos. And thank you so much for joining me each and every video, darlings. God bless. Bye.